Thanks for joining us for a North Greenville University Chapel service. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce one of my very best friends in the whole world to come and preach for you all this morning in chapel. Um, there's nothing worse than his hairstyle. And we couldn't find a podium that was short enough for him. So we just, yeah, sorry about that, man. But on the real, I'm introducing Ethan Broom. Now, this man loves hunting. He loves fishing. He loves his truck. And there are very few things that Ethan Broom loves more than hunting and fishing and trucks and Riley Green. That's right. But one, one of those things that he loves more than those things is the Word of God. And I know that for a fact because the encouragement that he's given me throughout our years together here at North Greenville, I wouldn't be the person I am today without his encouragement. Without, man, him just getting on my case about everything and, man, he makes me so mad sometimes, <laughs> honestly. But I wouldn't be the person I am today without him. He's a man of the word, and he makes a lot of jokes. But that's a good thing. we got to laugh a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just honored, man, to uh, be up here with you and hear what you got to say to us. And I'm going to pray for you, and then you're going to take us to the throne. That's what you're going to do. Um, let's pray. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for those words that were just sung. God, I thank you for the blood of Christ, God, that, that makes us righteous in your eyes, God. The work that you've done on the cross, Lord, and I pray that that message would be communicated through my, my dear friend, my dear brother, Ethan, this morning, God. I pray that he would preach that to, to this body of believers here, God. And God, I pray that if there's anyone in this room who has yet to make that step towards you of salvation, Lord. I pray that you would work in their hearts. Your Holy Spirit would convict them of their sin and call them to you, God. Father, I, I pray for Ethan, God. I pray that any nerves he would have would be calm, God, that he would have a peace that surpasses all understanding as he preaches this word this morning, God. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you will do, God. We're expectant and we're ready. We pray these things in the name of of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, after all that, I don't even know if I need to say anything. I might just walk off, but Drew, if I look like you, I'd probably make fun of somebody to look better myself, too. So, yeah, at least I'm not built like a ramen, a ramen, a ramen noodle. <laughs> all right, well, that was fear number one. I had two fears coming up on here. The first one was, I think. Somebody worked magic overnight and uh, shortened this podium for me. But I was scared that this was going to be taller than me, number one. Number two, I was going to get my tang tangled up. So that's already happened, so we'll get that out of the way. I mean, my tongue tangled up. Uh, yeah. So that's probably, um, that's two of the things that I was fearing coming up here for sure. But uh, one thing I was thinking, like, as Drew got up here, and, man, time and time again I've been in this chapel and I've seen people come up here, these speakers, and I've seen just the Lord work in mighty ways up here on this stage through the speakers to you guys. And, gosh, I was just praying. I was like, man, this is, this is bigger than me. Like, I don't know why I put so much stress on me. Like, this is way bigger than me. This is the faithfulness of people before me time and time again that got me up here on this stage. So the faithfulness of two people that I just think of immediately are Travis Bryan. I'm here because Travis Bryan, he mentored me. I went, I came like under him, basically he was like, NGU's the place for you, I was like, no, nah, Liberty, and he was like, no, nah, Liberty ain't got this and that, NGU, and I'm like, NGU ain't got this and that, and Liberty has this, or another place has this, and he's like, dude, just trust me, just trust me and go, pray about it, man, the Lord, time and time again, just answer, North Greenville, here I am, uh, I got here, and the faithfulness of Brett Jenkins Plowler, that's not his middle name, but that's what we call him, I would not be the man that I am today without Brett Plowler, like, that dude, and, and Drew Reynolds, let me call out Drew Reynolds, like, we're goofball, we're joking with each other, but man, them two guys right there, they mean everything to me, 
Um, but yeah, my name is Ethan Broom. I'm a, a super senior here. I got one more semester. I graduate in December. I don't have a clue what I'm going to do after, whether that's work for a church, try to work at North Greenville. I don't know. I'm going to convince somebody to take me in. But um, I enjoy hunting, fishing, and following Christ. That's about the three things that describe who I am. Country music, Christian music. That's about it. I'm as simple as that. But also, I am here because my mom and dad right here. So I have my mom and dad here this morning to be able to uh, listen and see where all their money has gone. <laughs> so they're going to see if it's worth it. Uh, I got my little bro right here, Wyatt. Um, so praise Wyatt for a little bit. He had a soccer game this past weekend. Nobody in the family's ever played soccer because we don't do that. It's football or baseball. And Wyatt scored three goals. One got called back, but he scored two. And I take the credit for that. You know why? Because he wants to be like his big brother. And his big brother always wore cowboy boots, right? So he went and got some cowboy boots when he was younger. Well, when he was in school, he got in trouble for wearing his cowboy boots because he was kicking the shin of his teacher and bruising her shins with his cowboy boots. So the man's got a leg on him. Look, he's laughing about it. He's got a leg on him. So I know he's going to be a great soccer player, or he might come to NGU as a kicker. You never know. But anyway, enough about me, enough about me. I want to talk about something. Well, while we're goofing around for a little bit, can I call up three people on this stage? So first I want, representing the athletes, I'm gonna, we're going to have like a little competition right here, but it's going to be used in the sermon. So, so we have this fishing, this fishing line here. Hold on, if I can get it out. All right, I have three pieces, right? So I want to call up Jesse Hack, the Alaskan fisherman. Where is he? This man... He can probably tie the best knot ever. I put my money on him. But I also want to call up Carson Curry. He's one of my residents in Crusader. That's right. I know where the lacrosse boys are now. That's right. Hey, so he's representing the athletes. So for all the athletes that didn't choose him, sorry, that's what you got. Um, Jesse's going to represent. You're going to represent the student body. Let's do that. And then Brett Jenkins, father, come on. Come on, get up here. Get up here. You had to get up here, bro. Hey, I just wanted to say, hold on, there you go, and here's your string. So tie it, get this out of the way, here, maybe tie yours right here, Carson. Jesse, you go right here, and Brett, you go right here. And they're going to tie, tie the best knot you can, the absolute best knot that you can. Don't let that knot slip. Don't let anything be wrong with this knot. I don't know what you have to do. I don't know if you've got to tap into your fishing abilities. I don't know if you have to tap into when you tie the things for your lacrosse polo stick, whatever that thing is, <laughs> and, and Brett, I don't know, I don't even know how to tie not kill. yeah, whatever you got going on, you were zip tying, last week you were zip tying apples, this week you're tying fishing line, I mean, we don't know what's going on, but hey, I just want to say something real quick, we're going to be in John 19, so go ahead and tur turn to John 19, we're going to be in Isaiah 53, so go ahead and mark that with something, fold the page maybe, or, and we're going to be in Romans 3, 23, so we're going to be going everywhere, but that's fine. Hey, so, you good, Jesse? Yeah. All right, man. Classic Alaskan, man. Classic fisherman. Woo. Fishing in Alaska. Tying them knots makes you more money than Bill Gates, baby. All right, you're good. You sit down. Hey, so, I'm the only two people I know that can introduce me are Drew or Brett, because they know me the best. I'm thankful it was Drew, because if it was Brett, that would make me look terrible walking up after Brett. But after this Drew, terrible knot. This is what terrible knot. <laughs> after Drew, I feel good about myself. You know, he's a clown. So, John 19, Isaiah 53, and Romans 3. Is everybody there? Say yeah, yeah, yeah. Is everybody there? Hey, it's not Justin Brown up here. You can respond. Don't be scared. Everybody there? All right, all right. So, a while ago, I don't know who it was at North Greenville or when it was. It was last spring in January, February. Somebody said... Preach the gospel to yourself every day. And I'm like, what's that even? Preach the gospel to myself? I mean, I understand what that means, but like, what does that mean? And so I was watching like Ray Comfort videos on YouTube. I don't know if you ever know that guy, but like he like goes in the streets and like schools people. And sometimes I'm like, dude, you're a jerk. And then sometimes I'm like, dude, that just worked. Like, you're awesome. And so him preaching the gospel as much as he does on the streets and having it on YouTube made me realize, hey, I can preach the gospel to myself every day. So 
it has been so good for me to remind myself of the love that the Father has for me every single day, literally daily, preaching the gospel to myself. If I miss it one day, that's okay. Probably going to preach it the next day. That's literally how much I do it now. It's changed my life. So the Lord's placed on my heart that very thing for you guys. The thing I preach to myself every single day is what I want to preach to you today. Um, It's changed my life, literally from the inside out. It's so hard for me to understand. I talk about this with Brett sometimes. It's hard for me to understand that I base my very life off of being a Christian, believing and trusting in the Lord. My very life, every decision I make, I go to him and I do because of him. And there's some people that don't even know his name. Some people don't even know his name. Some people in this room don't even know his name. And so that's what I'm bringing to you today. And sadly, like, one thing that's been going on in my life right now is death. Like, I don't know, you know, it could be the coronavirus. It could be, you know, cancer that somebody's been battling. It can be many different things. But the one thing that's been going on in my life is death. And death breaks me, like, you know your throat closes up like when you bury a dog or something like your throat closes up real tight and like you feel like you can't breathe you're so upset death just that that just it's like when you throw a rock in the water and the it just ripples like that's how death is for me it affects like the way I think and my days the next few days and like my prayers it just wrecks me but I want to tell you about four people that have passed away in the last month in my life right so first was a woman by the name of Sherry and the one thing, I just want to, like, tell you a little bit about them. So the one thing about Sherry is, is, like, I didn't know much about her. Sweet, sweet lady. In her 50s, maybe. Just the sweetest lady ever. And my sister, she's not here right now. I don't know where she went. She took the baby somewhere. But my sister right here was having, like, I don't know why there's 39 activities for a sh- wedding and all that stuff. But there's, like, so many activities before it goes down. And I would walk into these places, and Sherry would be there. I don't even know this woman, but like Ruth McWhite, she would just come up to you smiling, hey, sweetie, and I'm like, me, me, and she just made me feel like the most special person on the earth. She would ask me questions, be like, hey, how are you, you know, how's this going in your life, like, tell me about yourself, like, she made me feel like the most special person in the world. The love and comforting soul that she had, that's just what I remember about Sherry. Another one, Ed Hefner. So I do these fishing tournaments. He told you I was a fisherman. I do these fishing tournaments, and and, uh, I was there every day of the summer, last summer, um, winning money. Like, I was winning. I was winning them things. I was a good fisherman. But when you take your fish, when you catch your fish, you put it in this tote. You take it up to the front, and you weigh it. The fish shows up on a little screen if you stay up there how much the fish weighs. Let's say it weighs 18, 9. Then Ed is the guy that weighs the fish, puts the fish back in, and goes to the mic, and he goes, that fish weighed 18.9, 18.9, Ethan Broom. And that means my name goes on for the 30 minutes. Anyways, the thing about Ed is Ed made mistakes in his life, past mistakes, and he paid the penalty for it. He, whether he went to prison or jail, I'm not really sure. I didn't talk to him in depth about it, and I regret it. But, hey, he paid the penalty. And the one thing I noticed about Ed is because he paid the penalty, he was honest from that point forward. Every fish he took up there, he was honest. People could have maybe paid him a little bit more to lie about the weight of the fish. Ed was honest. Then there's Jeff Early. Jeff Early, he's the same one. He was at the pond fishing, and he, would, he was one that competed against me. And some people didn't like me because I was winning. Some people I didn't like because they were winning. We have rivals, right? But Jeff Early, he was a goofball. Like, the man would make jokes and laugh. He'd catch a fish, and it'd be the ugliest, skinniest fish. He'd be like, hey, Ethan, this fish looks like your mom. And I'm like... <laughs> Jeff, like, what are you even saying, dude? So, your mom jokes, that's 90s. Get rid of that. No, I'm just kidding. That's, those are good jokes. But, um, <laughs> Jeff, the one thing I noticed about that dude, dude, he always joked and he always laughed, but some type of cancer, you know, was ravaging his body, um, started this spring over the summer, and he just passed away. And it's so weird. They posted a picture of Jeff. They had, like, a bit, like, some type of thing to raise money for him at the pond. Everybody came and fished for him, and he got all the, the money, the donations. And he was holding a fish there, and I called one of my buddies on the pond. I was like, who's holding a fish? And he's like, that's Jeff Early. 
I saw this dude every day for a whole summer and couldn't even recognize him because the cancer was ravaging his body that much, like so skinny, looked totally different. I couldn't even recognize him. Broke my heart, broke my heart. The next one is a man by the name of Ralph Farmer. Now, the best way I can describe this man, he was a family man. He was always willing to help. He was selfless. Literally, the dude was everything that I want to be as a grandfather, a husband, anything. I don't even know that much about him, but I know that anytime I called him, again, fishing. He had something to do with fishing in my life. He would give me the recipes. He was good. Literally, there's a picture on Facebook of Ralph, and he's holding all his bass trophies from the tournaments. He was when he's sitting down, and the trophies are taller than he is, and the plaques he's holding more, than, more money than I got in my bank account. Like, the dude was an incredible fisherman, a great guy, a great husband, a great father. And he, one thing I noticed about Ralph is every time I would call him, like, I don't even have a relationship with you as far as, like, blood, family relation. But he would always say, hey, I love you, Ethan. And I'm like, dude, you're not in my family. Hey, love you too, Ralph. Bye. And hang up the phone. Like, the dude would always tell me, <laughs> thank you, Wyatt. Somebody's laughing. Um, <laughs> but the one thing is, all these people, this is the reason why it just breaks me. All these people deserve to hear the gospel. All of them, every single one, all four of them, and I didn't share it with them. Does anyone understand the significance of what I'm saying? That I can lead somebody to Jesus. I, like, they can come to the saving power of Jesus through hearing and me leading them. Through hearing the gospel, they can accept it and say yes through what I have through sharing the gospel with them. Like, but I didn't. So today, I vowed to myself that if I ever, ever got up on this stage, that I would preach the gospel and make Jesus' name known to everybody in this room, to all watching online, to anybody that ever comes across this video. Listen. Before we turn to John 19... I want you to know that from the beginning of time, God knew that you would be here in this room. He knew that you'd be sitting in the exact seat that you're sitting in. He knew that you would come in struggling with whatever you're struggling with. He knew that you would come in and maybe be on your phone in the back, not paying any attention. He knew that. Listen, I'm probably going to let you out early. Just give me a little bit of your time. God knows, and he cares for you, and he loves you. And he sent a savior for every single one of us. Me and you and you and you. So just give me a little bit of time. Zone in and listen to me. Let's turn to John chapter 19. While we do that, I'll say a prayer. God, thank you. Thank you that you know. Thank you that you brought us here today. And thank you for your word. May we be obedient and act on what you place on our hearts. You know, pray. Amen. So, John 19. I'm not even there myself. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> That's right. So, 19. 28 through 30. That's where we're going to start. All right. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on the hyssop branch, held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus said, It is finished. Now, we can take several points from this, but I, I, I want to focus on it is finished. What does that mean? What's being finished, right? Everybody's asking, even myself, as I looked into this. What's being finished? Who is finishing it? And why is it being finished? Like the greatest question of all time. When you're a kid, look at your parents, look at him. Why? Well, because I said so, but why? Like, why is it being finished? Seriously, who, what, why? And what does this mean for us? So in order to answer these questions, we need to go, go back to creation. We need to have a quick Bible recap. Maybe not quick, but a Bible recap of what's going on here. So creation in Genesis. In the beginning, God created you know, everything, the heavens and the earth. But he created man and woman. And man and woman, surprisingly, it was the pinnacle of his creation. Like, some, some things I don't understand. It was the pinnacle of his creation. Can you believe that, literally, it, it, it just, it's so crazy to me that God spoke a word, something was created. Like, 
man, my words don't mean anything. And nobody in here, like, I, I just think as a father, like, you're probably like, man, I wish my kids would do what I tell them to. Yo, God spoke, and there it existed. He placed the stars. When you look up at the stars, when you, every single one, where they are, like, what? But by the words of his mouth. Oh, uh, the ocean, exactly where it stops. It stops just at the right place to where it doesn't just swallow us all up. Like, the ocean stops exactly where it needs to stop. I think of, the, I think of a, a rocket scientist and a seven-year-old. Here's a rocket scientist, and he's standing here, and he's about to push the launch button. There's a seven-year-old beside him, and there's a rocket ship, you know, right here. And he's about to push the launch button to make it go, and the seven-year-old's like, yo, dude, this thing is too big. Like, there's no way it's making it to space. There's absolutely no way. And the old rocket scientist is looking at the little seven-year-old like, <laughs> he's got two options. He can explain rocket science to the seven-year-old, or he can just click the launch button. The rocket goes up into space, and the kid's like, <laughs> two options. He's got two options. Hey, that's how I feel sometimes in my relationship with God. Like, even, God, there's no way. Boom, time and time again, something happens. Creation, the way it is. I'm like, oh, my goodness. And as, a, as me to God, like, even if I ask him, like, okay, if he chose to explain the, the rocket science, I, I won't even understand it. Like, not only <laughs> am I just amazed at what he does, but even if he tried to explain it to me, I, how would I even understand it? Like, that's how good our God is. Anyway, back to your Relationships with humans is what God desired to have. The greatest thing humans have on this earth is relationships, and that is why we hate death. We hate losing someone. And so, again, man and woman were created for a purpose, and that was to serve and glorify God. Oh, so you're telling me, Ethan, that they, that's where it ends. So you're telling me this. You're telling me that. You're telling me that God created me for a reason, for a purpose. Yes, yes, I think of an old car. That car was made to get somebody to point A to point B, four-wheel drive, old Ford truck, I don't know. But it may be sitting in the back of some old guy's backyard with rust all over it. The, the, the purpose of the truck never changed. It still was created to get somebody from point A to point B. Maybe it's not doing that right now because it's all rusty and stuff, but we can restore that sucker, can't we? Like it can, The purpose of that car never changed. Just the position of it, okay? There's a big but. Big but here. So man and woman were created for a purpose, but the story goes on. The story doesn't end there. So you're telling me? Yes. But humans messed up. Adam and Eve tried to find satisfaction outside of the presence of God, and God punished them. That punishment separated humans from having a relationship with God. Wait, Ethan, you just said that punishment separated humans from having a relationship with God. Yeah, that's exactly what I just said. By humans, I mean me and you. Oh, you're probably in that seat. You're thinking, yeah, I ain't going to separate me. Like, I'm too good for that. Hold on. Let me just take a second to prove it to you. That sin that Adam and Eve, it, that punishment from them is passed down to us. Because Adam and Eve did what they did, that sin, you don't have to tell a baby like, a baby is naturally, it's born selfish. Like, it wants more milk. It wants to play with its toys. It doesn't want to share its toys. A baby. We see that evidence in a baby. Oh, Ethan, that's not enough for me. Um, okay. Um, Awanas, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Mm, you don't have me, Ethan. Oh, okay. Hey, can I get four volunteers? Huff, uh, Graham, Drew. Who else? One more. Connor Graves, come on. <laughs> hey, so now creation, God made us for a purpose, but that was messed up by Adam and Eve's sin, okay? And now I'm proving to you that we're all, we're all on the same page here, that sin is passed down to all of us, and there's proof in that. Turn to Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, real quick. Sorry, I'm coming to you guys. It may look weird right now. Isaiah 53. All right, I want to show you the, the, the distorted idea of sin that we have. Okay, you ready? 
hey, Connor Graves, we're going to call him Connor. <laughs> I was going to come up with a name, but we'll call him Connor. Goes to church every single Sunday, knows the Lord, prays every day, going into the ministry. Struggles with sin. People don't really know much about it. Huff, this weird mustache, so he's getting blamed. <laughs> Huff, he murdered. Cold blood. He's going to prison for life. He's in prison. We just got him out for this sermon. <laughs> Get over there. Hey, he, he lies and he cheats like no other. In his relationships with other people and on tests, on everything, he's a liar and he's a cheater. He ain't been to church in years. church he's just lukewarm he goes maybe what you say maybe like Christmas maybe Easter okay okay yeah um that's all he does but hey he knows who Jesus is and maybe he said the sinner's prayer when he was young he knows but he's just been out of line a little bit all right go right here all right this podium as a representation for this example real quick is going to be God all right so where does he stand? We're going to make a line from the people that are the most evil, furthest away from God, back here. And then the person that's the closest to God is going to be the closest to God. Okay? So I'm going to need y'all's help. Okay, so let's start with, uh, <laughs> let's start with Huff. <laughs> He's in prison, cold blood, unrepentant heart, just terrible man. Where do y'all, where do y'all think he should be? Scoot him back. Get back there. Get behind the drums. Get behind the wall. That's fine. That's fine. You're good. You're good, huh? <laughs> Woo! Okay, so. Oh, yeah, you're a liar and a cheat. Uh, push him back. Push him back. I know. I agree. Right here. Maybe right there. Because you're not that close to being that bad, bro. He's way old. Christmas and Easter, baby. Hey. Right here. Y'all agree? And then Connor Graves, in ministry, knows Jesus, shows up, pray every day. Bro, you, you get right here. Okay. This is the distorted view of sin that our culture has. The, some of you know what's wrong with this. Hey, when I learned this, changed my life. Everybody come here. Let's read Isaiah 53. Verse... Six. We'll start in four. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All, all of us. If I took everybody in this chapel, some of you would run. Y'all would already, like Forrest Gump, be in Alabama before I could get you up on stage to do this. You know? You're deceiving yourself if you think you're not a sinner in need of a Savior, okay? Look, there's these four people, and we just, we just totally, totally, like, terrible what we just did. But that's the view that we have. That's the distorted view. Okay, turn your back. Turn your back. This is God. Remember this. Connor was the closest. Turn your back. Turn around. Turn around. All right, everybody. Come on, we're going to make like a little rainbow real quick. That's fine. This is the right picture. Look, have you sinned? Yes. Have you sinned? Yes. You? Oh, yeah. You, Connor? Yes, sir. All right, y'all can sit down. Look, the same... We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the good news is, is the same sin is what qualifies us to be in need of a Savior. The same sin in the separation. We can't have a relationship with God because of that fall. That same sin qualifies us to be in need of the Savior. Ethan, you're talking Savior now. Yes, I am. Because the story's not done yet. So here we go. God sent his son, 316. We see right here in Isaiah 53, we see 
right before I talked about the sheep going astray, which was this representation. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace. By his wounds, we are healed. By whose wounds? Oh, man. Whoa. This dude in Isaiah knew what was happening. Yes. Okay. That's where we're going. Like, there's a Savior. And we see that evidence right here in the Old Testament. Okay, John 3, 16. For God sent his son. Um, for God so loved the world, he sent his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal. That's evidence of sin. I can't even, I got my tank on it. Can't even think. All right. He sent his son. Okay. He sent his son because he, for God so loved the world. You know, he sent his son. Okay. What was his son sent to do? That's where we're going. That goes right into being finished. Okay, hold on. Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life, teaching love and forgiveness. Okay, these are facts. And most of us in this room could probably, you know, state those. But why? Like, why did he send his son? Why did his son come and live a perfect, sinless life, teach love and forgiveness? Why? Okay, let's get into that. Here we go. This, this is why it is finished. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. His last words right there. We just read it in John 19. Why? We know who. We know it's Jesus. We know what's going on because we read it. We've all turned our back. There's a, there's a punishment for that. There's a gap that we can't fill. We can't have a relationship with God anymore, right? Oh, no, not right. The story's not over. Let's keep going. So it is finished. Before the arrest of Jesus by the Romans, Jesus prayed his last public prayer where he asked the Father to glorify him even as he has glorified the Father. He said, finish the work you have given me to do. Oh, Ethan, you're telling me that Jesus had a mission when, when, when God sent him? Yes! He says, finish the work that you have given me to do. It's not just love and forgiveness and living the perfect. There's more. And let's keep going because we're going to finish out, <laughs> finish the why to that. Okay, the work of Jesus is to seek and to save that which is lost and to provide atonement for sinners whom Jesus died for to rec reconcile them to God. Romans 3, Romans 3. Let's go, let's go. Everybody turn to Romans 3. Three twenty three. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Proof. Proof, you're deceiving yourself if you don't think you fall short of the glory of God. I'm here to tell you that. Listen, if my sins, if any of our sins were displayed on this screen or the things that we thought in the last week, you'd probably, again, like Forrest Gump, hightail it to Alabama before it even got started. Listen, you're deceiving yourself if you think you're not in need of a Savior. Look, 323, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Good news. Great news. Now we know. Like, we know why he was sent. He was to seek and to save the lost. He's on a mission. Jesus died to reconcile us with God. None but the Lord God could accomplish to save with that authority. It is finished. None. None but Jesus. All right? When Jesus said it is finished, like in Isaiah 53, he brought about the completion of Old Testament prophecy, symbols and foreshadowing about himself. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of Malachi, there are 300 detailed prophecies about the anointed one Jesus, which are fulfilled by him. From the seed in Genesis 3, crushed the serpent's head, to Isaiah, Isaiah 53, we just saw it, the suffering servant. He completed every single one of those when he, when he said, it is finished. All right, let's keep going. Jesus is saying, and it is finished, that the debt owed by man to his creator on account of Adam's sin is finally and forever dealt with. Jesus, with it is finished, is saying that not only does he take away man's sin, but now he removes it as far as the east is from the west, for it is finished, done, sealed, signed, done, gone. Listen, east is from the west. He removes it as far as east is to the west. You know what I like about that? East. All right, you run. Let's run. Let's go east. You never go west. You just continue to go east. But north and south, when you go north, you end up going south. Whoa. East is from the west. You never get to the west. You keep going east. What does that mean? Forever. Future, present, past, all. Every single bit of it. Oh. 
It's done. It's signed. It's sealed because the blood of Jesus. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, it means that he provides the only solution to man's sin and the only way to God through himself. It is only through the death of Christ that Christians can put to death their sin and put on Christ. Listen, I'm going to read that again. I'm going to read that again. When Jesus said that it is finished on the cross, it means that he provides the only solution to man's sin and the only way to God. There's no other way. It is only through the death of Christ that Christians can put to death their sin and to put on Christ. Listen, this, I came to know Jesus June 26, 2012, and the speaker that week was Christian Chapman. He shared a story about when he was at Southern Wesleyan University. He played baseball there. And this story just, I mean, he had just preached the gospel. He had just spoke out creation, fall, Jesus. It is finished. It is done. And then he goes on to this story. And I called him and I said, yo, Christian, this was four or five years ago. I mean, I got saved in 2012. I mean, it was forever ago. And I said, you need to send me, I call it the Rosebush story. You need to send me a voicemail, write it down. I'll come to your house. I don't care where you live, what's going on. I, I, I just want to know that story. Stories are powerful. Stories can shed light on the truth. And that, the story that he presented to me that night shed light on the gospel that he shared. And it, the gospel changed me from the inside out. Again, it's why I make the decisions I make and continue to live the way I do. Look, I want to tell you the story. I want to share the story with you. So Christian, I might mi misuse some pronouns, say he, they, or I, because I'm used to listening to it on my voicemail, and he is saying I and the boys, and now I'm trying to explain it as he so here you go this is the rosebush story his freshman and sophomore year at southern wesleyan he had to take a tutoring class he took a couple tests and he figured out he had a reading disorder he came into southern wesleyan as 24 years old and had a reading disorder it kind of makes me laugh but he had to get tutored and he was embarrassed that he couldn't read properly so he never told anyone on the baseball team Never told anyone. When he walked into the bottom of the library for the first se session, everybody in the room was an athlete. <laughs> and I don't know if that was just, you know, the system and how they had it set up, but he laughed because he was scared to tell anybody. But everybody in the room was an athlete. And so he got a little kick out of that. But all the athletes in there were talking smack, you know, having a good time. And in came the teacher. Miss Freeze. She was a very elderly woman, very sweet. She has crystal blue eyes, and she was inside of like an 80-year-old body, like any Disney picture, you, Disney Pixar, I think, you think of a grandma. This is what she was. I mean, crystal blue eyes, 80-year-old body. She had her hair in a little bun, you know, probably these down the glasses. And she came in the class to all these athletes and said this, God's got a plan for your life, and it's not to be stupid. And <laughs> so he laughs. Because, like, this lady came in here talking smack to all the athletes. Like, that's funny. And she said, look, the school told me to teach you a certain curriculum, but I'm not going to. I'm going to teach you the Bible. She said, if I can teach you to read the Bible, then I know you will become the men God created you to be. This is the athletes. You know, this lady ain't intimidated at nothing. She'll, she'll beat you with her cane. She said, let me, we're going to read the Bible. Every Tuesday and Thursday, they would meet for this class, and these guys fell in love with this sweet lady while reading God's Word. She was just a genuine sweet lady. She would bring cookies, you know, everything in class. She was always nice to the athletes. She would support them, go to their games. The baseball team knew that she was single because when they would go to the soccer practices and games, so in the same season, I don't really understand it all, but they would go to the, the girls' soccer games and support, and they would see Miss Freeze in her house across the street. And they knew she was single because she would sit out on the porch, she would come to the soccer field, and she was never with another man. Sometimes the guys would go over there and eat some cookies and milk in her house, again, because she was just that kind of lady. Then one day, Christian, Christian Chapman, decides to mess with her a little bit, and he said, we're going to throw in a little money and get you a blind date. 
because you are single. We don't really know why you're single, but that's our plan. <laughs> oh, man. She said, well, I'm single, and my husband, he passed on. But I want to tell you a story about who he was. He was a professor here at Southern Wesleyan. And Southern Wesleyan, to his knowledge, was the first school in South Carolina to enroll an African American because Mr. Freeze, he stood up and said that he would resign his tenure if they would not follow the kingdom. In a board meeting, he said, I'm going to resign if you're not going to follow the kingdom here and, al and allow us to enroll African Americans. So they actually enrolled an African American because of his faithfulness. He volunteered at the church, worked at the church with the youth. Hey, he took care of the grounds, did all the landscaping at the church, and he was an amazing father, husband, and grandfather. She talked about how they would go on dates and walk around Lake Hartwell and watch the sunset together. And he would always tell her how beautiful she was, look into his eyes and say, you're beautiful, and how lucky he was to have her. And so the man was just an absolute stud. <laughs> the team was blown away by hearing about his life journey. She then said that a while back, Mr. Freeze got stomach cancer. And to watch the love of your life suffer was bad. But out of the three months that he suffered, it was almost unbearable. He was in a diaper, and she had to pick him up and get him out of bed to go and use the bathroom. And it was so sad to see the love of my life, to see the love of her life and the pain he was in by cancer ravaging his body. So one day, the pain, it's unbearable. She hates to see it. He's suffering. She goes to get him medication, local CVS, wherever. And as she's out going and getting medication, because he's in a lot of pain, she comes back. And she noticed when she pull, pulled into the driveway that there was a freshly planted rose bush right near where she parked her car, right in the mulch. She parked her car there many years, but noticed that there was a difference, that the red rose bush was there. But she didn't know how it got there. So has his medicine, gets out of the car, and sees this rose bush and notices that there is a pile of mud kind of smeared in the driveway where the rose bush was planted. And up to the kitchen, she followed it. She followed it up to the kitchen area. She followed the mud down the hallway and into the bedroom. And that's where she saw him laying on the bedroom floor. He was collapsed because of exhaustion while trying to get into the bed. See the mud smeared on the bed, mud smeared all the way to him. He was covered in the mud because he had laid in the mud and planted her the rose bush. The day after she called the ambulance, he goes to the hospital the day after he passed. She mentioned how when you are married to that kind of a man, like he was, you can't replace that. And so she was waiting until she went home to be with her heavenly father and to see her husband again. I think of this story and I think, when someone loves you that much, when the, he is a man like that, it cannot be replaced. I want to tell you something. There's somebody that loves you more than that. And it cannot be replaced by anything that the world tells you that it can be replaced by. This story, to me, sheds light on the gospel that I share with you guys from creation to fall and Jesus to come. The mud. Like, that can represent so many things. That can represent... Jesus and the blood that was shed and he was covered in that can represent our sin our debt that he took on himself nastiness the rose bush the good God sent his son the relationship between the two of them the relationship that we have with God the relationship that we have with others and the suffering this, this story it's powerful and it tugs at your heartstring a little bit it does mine but the gospel it's even more powerful. And the thing that's different between that story and the gospel is you play a part. Remember when I said, that we'll come back to the four people that I talked about at the beginning, four people who have passed? Listen, they deserve to hear the gospel. They deserve to hear the gospel. But now they don't have a chance to respond to it. But the difference is that you guys do. Listen, your eternity is on the line as you sit in this seat. Every day that goes by, your eternity is on the line. It's your turn. You have a chance to respond. And how you 
spend eternity is based on your response to the gospel. Let's look at this. Okay. This right here. This was Curry, right? Representing all the athletes. To every athlete in this room, you're not slipping, Bo. Wow. You're not stayed there. Right here, Jesse Hack, representing the student body. Best fisherman I know. His not stay together. Has anybody seen a pattern? Brett right here. <laughs> well, that's just embarrassing, but <laughs> that just kind of messed up my now my point, my illustration. But my point is is to all the athletes in the room that think you're too tough, too strong for the gospel, let me tell you something. The world tells you, oh, oh, tie your knot into this. Tie your knot into this. It'll satisfy. You'll be an athlete forever. Let me tell you something. I just spent the summer with multiple quarterbacks, multiple athletes, famous people. And you know what they told me? Is that, that's the problem. Is that when you get there, you realize that it still doesn't satisfy. Yo, your, your promise that you'll find satisfaction in these things, right? No, actually you won't. What I didn't tell everybody that came and tied this knot, look, look, student body, you're, you're going to be the best businessman. You're going to make the most money, right? The string breaks, the string breaks. My point is here, I didn't tell them that it was only eight-pound test and that the string would break before their knot gave up. And in the same way the world tells you, so you'll find satisfaction in something? No, you won't. Yo, we long for these things, and it's, it's already done. It, go back to the creator. The blood of the per perfect sacrifice was shed, and it is finished. It is evident and clear where you need to go. Ask any Christian in here. The answer is no, that it's easy. It's not, it's not easy. But you can be saved simply by saying, admitting that you need God, Asking them to forgive you, trusting in Jesus alone to rescue you, and following Jesus Christ in faith from this day forward. To the Christians in the room, after hearing the gospel and the rosebush story, I think, I think, can you imagine the pain that the guy was going through when he planted the rosebush? He had nothing left. He couldn't even get up to use the bathroom, but he got up because of his love for his wife to plant the rosebush. Listen, in the same way, can you imagine that you're there at the crucifix, Jesus getting whipped, and you're there and you're like, dude, get up. Yo, what are you doing? Yo, he's sitting there, and on his mind is, I've not finished the work that I'm sent here to do. On his mind is the love that he has for the Father and the Father's love for us, every single one of us in this room. Yo, I can't imagine what I'd be doing in that moment. Like, get up, dude. Like, what are you doing? Like, even my selfish, selfish nature, I say, Jesus, stop this. Like, get up and the amount of love and selflessness that that took, I can't even, I, I can't even understand it. This is the work that the Father has sent me to do. And he finished that work. And guess what? As sons and daughters, to the Christians in the room, as sons and daughters, he's given us work too. Go and make disciples. Yo, it is finished. Jesus defeated the death in the grave. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward for his suffering. Yo, Jesus defeated death in principle with his decisive victory over death. He is now triumphant over, the de over death and the grave. It is finished. The power of sin and Satan is finished and done. But we're not acting like it. What are we doing? He's given us work and we're not doing it. The good news is when the people of God fell, there is still no condemnation for them because of the union with Christ. I want to close with this. What will satisfy is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, knowing that you are a sinner in need of a Savior and that God has provided a Savior through the person and the work of Jesus. You must abandon on all reliance on yourself and flee to Christ. When Jesus said it is finished, no longer do you have to wonder what to put your faith and trust in. The finished work of Jesus is the beginning of new life in him for all who were once dead in their trespasses and sins are now made alive with Christ. Hey, let's pray. Grace. What have you done? You were murdered for me on that cross, accused in absence of wrong. My sin was washed away in your blood, and I can't make sense of it all. 
Jesus, you died in my place so that my soul will live. Lord, to all the people who are unbelievers in the room, will they put their faith and trust in you and realize that they're a sinner in need of a Savior? And do all the Christians in the room realize that there is still work that needs to be done and every day realize what Jesus has done for them as well? We love you, and we thank you for your finished work. Amen. Thanks for joining us for a North Greenville University Chapel service. 